All right. It is 2 o'clock, so it is uh, my time to bore you guys. So, For those of you that don't know, I'm Dan. I'm Josh's evil twin. I'm the other TA that does the other people there. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is DNA fingerprinting. And what DNA fingerprinting really, what it gives you is it's a way to determine relationships. And in this, a big part of this class so far has been like determining re relationships between people. So how are the ways that we have been taught so far to determine relationships? Not necessarily between two people, but between different species, that sort of thing. So how have we done that? Evita. Yeah, so you look at the sequences and then what do you do? Anyway, next, someone else that's not the feeder. So we have some sequences. Yeah. Exactly, and does anyone want to tell me where those differences come from? Like, what is the ultimate source of differences in the genetic code? Somebody not in my lab section. Josh, what's the difference? Where do they come from? Uh, starts, yeah, it starts with M. Anyone else want to try? No? Yes. Exactly. So they all come from mutations. So when you're determining relationships, you need to find a section of DNA which mutates a certain speed. So it has to be fast enough. The mutation rate has to be fast enough so that you can tell that it's different, right? Because otherwise you couldn't tell them apart. If the sequence was exactly the same, you, you couldn't tell it apart, right? It has to be similar enough so that you can tell that it's the same spot. So, um, and what DNA fingerprinting does is it allows you to do that with humans, basically. And does anyone know when the most recent ancestor of all humans was? How long ago did we evolve? That's the right magnitude. Does anyone else want to have another shot at it? Magnitude meaning number of zeros, basically. It's 200,000, okay? Uh, so I didn't really expect that you would have known that, but it's 200,000, so it's not that far away. It's not that distant. But the, um, the other piece of information is that for about 100 and something years, there was very few of us. So um, we actually all descended from a common ancestor, which they believe is one female about 64,000 years ago? No, no, Lucy was um, 1.4 million years ago and was um, another species altogether. But I like the way that you're thinking. All right. Does anyone know the name of what they're calling that most recent ancestor? Exactly, yeah, so it's Eve. Um, and it's believed that she lived around 64,000 years ago. So we're gonna be very, very similar. There's not gonna be too many mutations that would have occurred between then and now, and there's certainly not enough nucleotide mutations. Does, do we know what I mean by nucleotide mutation? Anyone? Who? What? All right, Davida, you go. Um, so it's not like where you have an extra or um, unique set of genes, but like the actual nucleotide. Exactly. So it's called a nucleotide substitution. So, at, so, and then what is the difference between all of us? If we're talking about nucle nucleotide substitution. How similar are we all? Very similar. So does anyone know the number? Yes. Yeah, it's more than that, actually. It's actually one in a thousand bases. So between Josh and myself, and as you know that we're twins, there's a, uh, actually we're not <laughs> twins. Um, yeah, there's one in every thousand bases is going to be different. So that's not very much, and in order to and if we wanted to determine relationships with using sequencing, that would be, we'd have to sequence a lot of code. We'd have to sequence a lot of sequence, basically, in order to determine the difference. So what we do is what we learned about when we were considering dogs, how they came about. We use microsatellites. And um, yeah, so yeah, I already said that. I already said most of this. So microsatellites, again, they're short repeats. And the way it comes about, and this is, should be review for you, is that Basically, whoa, whoa, easy, sorry. Basically, we see some loop out here. So because this can equally bind to that or that, and some of the time it will, by mistake, bind to that, and you get a loop out here, and that's an insertion, basically. So you've got more, more code there than you used to have, so you're going to have a longer sequence. 
This happens all the time. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of your genome has is just these microsatellites, and that causes a whole bunch of issues. But mostly, this is happens all the time, so it's a much more frequent mutation than just a nucleotide substitution. Um, and the other advantage to this is that it's really easy to find it. So what you just you just look for a bigger piece of DNA, and we're going to explain how that works. Um, and what there's two ways really to figure out how big they are, and this is the old way, and it's the way. Question. Yay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. I'm hearing some feedback, which is somewhat cool. But how's that? That's good. All right. So, um, yeah. They're called BNTRs, um, and we're going to talk about this in lab tomorrow. So it'd be good to listen, and that way you'll do well in the quiz tomorrow. Um, there are a whole bunch of microsatellite loci, and I am reverberating again. There's about 100 of um, different locations which contain microsatellites. Um, and again, like, like it says on the slide, different individuals have different number of tandem repeats. And we can tell people apart by the number of tandem repeats they have at any given loci. Um, and here's a good picture of it right here. So what we're seeing here is this one has about seven repeats, whereas this one just has one in this particular microsatellite loci. And the other thing to know right now is, yeah, so, wow, that's cool. Um, this point here and here, sorry, there, and there, that's the exact same part. So really what you've just got is a bigger piece of DNA in the same part. Okay, so this piece here relates to that piece there, and so on. And that this piece here relates to that. Well, you can kind of tell that because they're aligned in that way. Does that make sense? So we're all cool right now? Okay, so there's two ways that we can basically get these sizes of DNA out, um, out of the genome. And the first one is this thing here. It's called restriction fragment length polymorphisms. And just from the name, you can kind of tell what this, what this experiment would be. So, so that's what you're going to do right now. So tell me this experiment. Let's just, uh, let's just decipher this word. So does anyone want to tell me what polymorphism means? Anyone? Yeah, it, means, it actually means many forms, but that essentially is what it is. In this case, it's uh, many mutations. And what this really means is many sizes. So the different form is a different size. Fragment length is pretty obvious, and restriction. What's that referring to? Oh. Anyone? What's, what are, you've heard this word before, and you did it in the lab. What is restriction? Exactly, it's restriction enzymes. So basically, this technique is, oh, it even says it there, um, is that you're going to cut up all the DNA into, with restriction enzymes. And this is not necessarily where the restriction site would be. It could be here, it could be there, it could be just about any, anywhere. But know that, again, that that relates to that, and that that relates to that, and that this will probably be a different restriction site than this one. Um, so basically, you cut the DNA using a specific thing. We run a gel, and you've done this before. Um, and the difference between this time and that time is basically size. So how many, uh, how many bases does the human genome have? Nucleotides. Three trillion, right, that's a whole bunch. And when you did this in lab, you did this exact thing in lab, but we only had 6,000. So that's a whole bunch more. So if you ran a gel with this, you'd end up with that. And basically, it's a smear. And then somewhere in here are these fragments, right? And that know that there's 1.5 trillion bases this way and the other way there. Actually, not exactly, because there's different chromosomes. But uh, and so now we, yes. Sorry, what? What? Tell me the difference between the bases. So what we're trying to do is get the yeah. Ultimately, it'll determine the differences in that. But we're trying to cut those pieces of DNA out and compare sizes. Really, that's what we're really trying to do here. And remember, the restriction sites aren't necessarily there. I just put them there because they fit on the slide. Um, and the way we do that, so basically we have this, um, this gel, and inside this gel is all the DNA. So we need to get that DNA out of that gel in the exact same place as it is here, 
and so that we can do use other techniques. And what we use is a technique called southern blotting. And the way this works is there's your gel. So you stick a bunch of paper towels on a filter, a nitrocellulose paper, which is essentially a coffee filter. Okay, it does, pretty much does the same thing. Here's our gel, and underneath is the alkali solution. And what's alkali? What's another word starting with B that means alkali? Exactly. So um, what that is, and what is, I mean, it's nucleic acid, so you know it's an acid. So you mix a base and an acid. And really what happens is it denatures the, the, um, the DNA, so it brings apart the two strands, okay? And what it also does is this stack of paper towels sucks all the liquid up through the, um, through the gel and through the filter into this. It's kind of like when you put a sponge on something. The sponge just sucks up all the liquid, right? So what's happening here is the solution is picking up the DNA, it's denaturing it, and it's sticking it onto this nitrocellulose paper. And um, so we have basically a copy of that gel on this paper, and the DNA is out so that we can get to it. Then what we do is we do southern hybridization. So anytime you really you want to find a specific piece of DNA, what's the automatic thing that you should be thinking now? We've done this a few times with microarrays, a bunch of other things. So anytime you want to find some specific DNA, what would you use? It actually says it kind of there. So you'd, you'd find a piece of Yeah, you'd find a tag, and what, what, what was the specific thing about the tag that makes it find? Yeah, that's, that's there. It's something else. How about you at the back? What is it? Exactly, it's complimentary. Thank you, Joe. Joe's my buddy, by the way. He's like this hanger on here. So you find a, um, a complementary sequence. You use a complementary sequence. Uh, there's our microsatellite. So that is a really terrible thing to do to use a complementary sequence to because we know that there's a whole bunch of these, so you're not going to get a specific thing. So you find a piece of DNA that flanks it, and you make a radioactive probe. This is a radioactive atom, um, and the typical ones that you'd use is sulfur or phosphorus or, or uh, hydrogen, actually. You can use a hydride atom. Um, and I'm not going to talk to you about that physics. So you've got a complementary sequence, and stuck to it is an atom that is radioactive. And the other way that you can actually make put these radioactive atoms in amongst that sequence is the other way that you would do it. So know that that's your original DNA, your sample DNA, and that it's denatured, so there's only one strand. This basically sticks to that. And then, I've never seen anyone actually use a baggie for this, usually use a tray, but... Um, so you just mix the nitrocellulose paper with the DNA probe, and anywhere that has this specific sequence here, this radioactive probe is going to stick to. And we've designed that sequence. So that sequence there will match a sequence that's close to, is complementary to a sequence that's close to the microsatellite. And then what you do is you take that piece of paper and you stick some x-ray film on it. And because this is radioactive, it is giving off x-rays and you So the, con the, the purpose of it is that it will bind to that specific region of DNA. So anytime, and you'll be asked this question a whole bunch, anytime you need to find a specific sequence of DNA, you always use the complementary sequence. That's, that's what we do with microarrays. We, do, we use it in other ways. Is that making sense? Am I confusing you a little more? Or? What you, well, you actually make it. So we synthesize it ourselves. We sequence that piece there prior to this, and then we've made the complementary exactly what we need. And that's, that we, we do that really, really well. Um, so where am I? X-ray paper, right? So we put the X-ray paper on this thing here, which we know has radioactive spots. This is only going to bind to the areas that have this sequence, and in this case, those three areas. So we get that in X-ray paper. And I don't have a real picture of that, but you get the picture. Voila. Yeah. So here is the original example. You can see the restriction sites, and you can see how that, that would give that. Does anyone not see how that sequence there is going to get that? All right. We're all on board here. Okay. Okay. So what we have, does anyone else not get it? Because I can talk to you afterwards. Okay. What's that? 
All right. Okay. So hmm, now what do I do? So we've cut all of our genomic DNA with restriction enzymes, and they're at different sizes. Um, then what we've done is made a gel, so it's that, that gel right there. So all the DNA is there, and somewhere in here is that piece right there, and that piece there, and that piece there, and that piece there. Okay, Somewhere in there, and we don't know where. And that bigger pieces are going to be higher because they're not going to run as far, right? Remember? Smaller pieces will be further down. Then we've made, stuck this to it, and it's made that particular band radioactive, and then the radioactivity is exposing the x-ray paper. We got it now? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, and this, is, this will be in the quiz tomorrow, by the way. Um, maybe not in the depth that I'm telling you at, but it will be there. So we can see how we get that from there. That's not really how it's done now, and the reason for that is that this technique takes loads of DNA. So remember that we're talking about forensics here. Or did I? I didn't tell you that. So we're talking about forensics here. We want to be able to, <laughs> we want to be able to identify one person, right, from everybody else, and everybody has different microsatellites. And obviously, having being able to have a technique which uses very little DNA is a lot better than having a technique in which you need a lot of DNA, because then when you have a a crime scene and there's only a little bit of DNA there, you wouldn't be able to prove it with that technique. You would need another technique, and that's the one I'm going to tell you about now. So um, the way it's done right now, which is not what you're doing in lab tomorrow, is use the poly polymerase chain reaction. And this is how it works. So the first thing that happens is you heat up the DNA, and know that this is thousands of strands, not just one. So um, you heat up the DNA, it separates, then in the mix, you're going to have these things called primers. And what primers are, are short sequences of DNA, about 20 to 25 base pairs long, exactly what it says right there, that are complementary to that exact same region. So in the last example, the RFLP example, we got specificity by using, because of the restriction enzyme sites. In this case, we're using complementarity um, here. Actually, we got specificity using the um, complementary probes. Uh, but here we're using the primers. So that's going to bind there. And with DNA replication, which firstly, uh, you don't have to know this in any great depth. I'm just telling you now because I thought it was cool, basically. But um, I'm just going to explain the technique. What you will have to know is ramification. So this technique gives you something. And you'll have to know about what it gives you and how it's used. So don't worry too much about the science here. So DNA replication, what's that? Anyone? All right, Pavita. Um, isn't, it's, it's meeting the complementary strands? Yeah, it's, crea it's basically you're amplifying the DNA. So you start with two strands, or one molecule of DNA, and then you're making two, all right? And polymerase chain reaction is just it's a way that we've used DNA replication in order to amplify DNA. And the advantage to, and the good thing about, about PCR is that we can just amplify the specific region that we want. So we're not stuck with that, the situation where you run a gel and there's a, all that other DNA there. This is only going to have the pieces of DNA that we want, and they're going to be amplified, and they're going to be in high, high concentration. So all you really need to do is replicate. Replication requires a primer. It doesn't work without it. So you just have a primer. It's complementary to the exact spot that you need it to be. And replication occurs. And then we have two strands. So basically here, we've got two strands where there used to be one. And then it's only the piece of DNA that we need. And it's a chain reaction. So that means that it's chained. So it starts again. So here it is here. Um, after three cycles, we're going to have eight where we had one. And usually we do, we run this for 20 to 25 cycles, and at the end of it, we have 50,000 strands from every, more than 50,000 strands from every one that we started with. So you can see this is a way in which you'd start with a very little DNA, and then you'd end up with a lot of it, and then it's going to be exactly the DNA that we need and no other. And then essentially we're doing the same thing here. So I put the primers here, but they would be everywhere. So from this reaction here, we're going to have a piece of DNA that's about yay big. And then this one here, we're going to have a piece of DNA that's that big. And basically, you can see, tell how this would end up in that. 
Are we, yes? So then PCR is just replicating only the segments that we're targeting? Exactly. Not all the other crap. Yeah, so we don't have to worry about all that other crap. We just have the stuff that we need. And there's lots of it from very, very little. So yeah, basically we end up, and these are all different microsatellites. And why is there two for each allele? So different colors are different alleles, but why is there two for each allele? Yeah, why, what does that mean? Anyone? Because one of them comes from our mom and one of them comes from our, from our father. We are, we're what's called diploidal. That means that we get one strand from, our par from each of our parents. And that's why we have two alleles for each of them. Um, the FBI uses this technique. They call it something different. It's called short tandem repeats. Um, and there's 13 of them. One comes from each chromosome. And remember, we have 26 pairs we have 26 chromosomes, which is 13 pairs of chromosomes, one from our mom and one from our dad. So there's one microsatellite loci for each, from each of, uh, each of our chromosomes. Um, and there's also a database called CODIS, which is written there. And basically, right now, I thought what we could do is you guys talk amongst yourself and consider the ethical considerations of having this database. So the, the real questions are, who should be in the database? At what point should we collect DNA from people? And who should be excluded? So for a few, maybe two minutes, talk amongst yourself, and then let's consider the ethics of this case. So go. So what are we thinking? Does anyone? So we had had people here that believe that everybody on the planet should be tested, basically should be have their DNA collected because they're innocent anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But is that is that your argument? Yeah, yeah they're innocent. Yeah. Um, so do, does anyone disagree with that? disagree with that? Everyone's cool with suspects having their DNA collected? Does anyone want to move on to the next thing? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Josh.
I, yeah, I, I guess. Um, Then you'd be able to catch someone if you, as long as you got some DNA evidence from a, from a crime scene, you'd be able to catch anyone basically. So everybody, okay, that's interesting. I didn't think that was how New York University was going to come out. But, uh, but the other consideration here that I really stuck us up too late, but that um, DNA can't, can be used for this, but it can also be used for other things. We know with the health insurance debate right now that they put in a clause where you cannot exclude anyone for any reason. But um, prior to that. A health insurance could actually drop you from your insurance if, um, if they found out you had a pre-existing condition. And DNA can be used for that exact reason. So this database could technically be abused in that way. So that would be another consideration, but I didn't really put that up, really. The other thing that Micro said, does anyone have, you put your hand up, did you have something to say? What's that? Okay, yeah. Um, so the other thing that this can do is paternity testing. And the way that that works is really, as I said a few times, you get one of your alleles from your mother and one of them from your father. And all you really need to do is exactly what's here. So um, yeah, dad has these alleles, mum has those alleles. We know that they get half from each and that's basically half from each. And we don't need the father because we know, yeah, that half of them are gonna match. So if half of them do match, then we know that he is very, very likely to be the father. We're going to talk about numbers in a second. This has another piece of information here. Does anyone, so these guys got two alleles of the same, right? What does that mean? What's that word? It starts with H. Yeah, so he's a homozygous. So basically in this one, what it does with paternity tests is it can exclude very, very well. So it can disprove paternity extremely well. And any time you have little Johnny has an allele that, doesn't, that dad doesn't have, that's a guaranteed exclusion. So therefore, he must not be the father. Um, in this case, has another there's another piece of information. Because he has, he's homozygous, little Johnny must have an allele there. So in this case, if there was an allele that, if this allele wasn't there, then you would know little Johnny is not, not the son. Um, and if there was a, an allele anywhere else, you'd also know that the paternity wasn't, wasn't that. Um, but they usually, when you watch Maury or whatever the other, those other <laughs> terrible shows, not so much Maury because he just says you are the dad, but um, if you watch Judge Mathis, he says you are 99 point blah, 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 the father, okay? Um, and what I thought, actually I'm running out of time, so I'm just, what I was going to do here is get you guys to determine how you would get that number. But I'm just going to do that because uh, I have to be somewhere else. So the way that works is we know that we have two alleles from <laughs> two alleles from each at each loci. So basically you'd get say he has one with three repeats, and the prevalence in the population in which they got the DNA from is 0.1. And then he'll have another one that's maybe 0.7, uh, seven repeats, and the prevalence is 0.3. And you multiply those two together, you do the same with all three, and at the end of that you're gonna get a number that's very, very small, right? So it's going to be like 0 0.1 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.25 times 0 0.15. At the end of that, you're going to have a very, very small number. And remember that there's 13 loci. So when you do that for all 13, the, the chances of you having, of there being another match by chance is one in a billion. So, and we know there's seven billion people. So it's very, very unlikely. Um, that's where they get the numbers from. And this can be used for other things. Does we we call on that? That's pretty simple, right? Um, yeah, I'm not going to go over that. So other ways that you can use this DNA profiling is endangered species breeding programs, and what that is is basically you genotype the species. Sorry, each individual in the species, and what you're really trying to do is maintain every allele in that population that you have. So, and the best way to do that is using this exact technique. It's mostly the RFLP technique that's used for this particular thing, because it gives you a little bit more information. But um, yeah, you just determine which alleles any individual has, and you want to mate it with another individual that has 
the most different number of alleles. Um, can also identify victims of, catastrophe, of catastrophes. In 9-11, there were something like 1,500 casualties that they just didn't know. We know that the World Trade Center has, it's the World Trade Center, so it's got people from all over the world. They didn't know who was in there. They didn't know where they were from. And they used DNA profiling to, to uh, identify them. Um, and they're also using it right now to ID poached animals and animal products. So. The ivory trade, basically they know where all the ivory is because it is surplus animals from national parks. All of the legal ivory that's sold right now comes from that source and they've genotyped every one of them. So all they need to do is go into some market somewhere in the world and get the, the ivory, do the DNA tests on it and they'll know whether it came from a poached animal or from a real animal and they're trying to prevent that. Um, whale meat is the other thing. that uh, We know that Japan, for scientific reasons, um, harvest some some whales. They harvest what whales do they harvest? Does anyone know what whales they harvest? Minke whales, isn't it? Yeah. So they harvest minke whales, and then they sell that minke whale meat on the in supermarkets in Japan. But um, it turns out they were harvesting other whales as well, and we found that out by using this technique. And my university back in New Zealand found that one out. Uh, but that's it. So. Enjoy your day. Do, do we have any questions? Sorry. So enjoy your day. Can everybody hear me? OK. All right, so uh, I'm Joshua. I'm the other TA. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about personal genomics. Um, so this is kind of building on what Dan talked about, except uh, increasing the scale, where you're getting a lot more genetic information um, on individuals. So uh, basically, I'm going to talk about how the decrease of the cost of genome sequencing is um, making it more and more feasible to sequence the actual genome of an individual and not um, uh, just certain regions of the genome. So this is going to let uh, researchers do much larger scale experiments studying um, genetic diversity in humans. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the implications, both good and bad, about uh, this increase in knowledge. All right? So um, first, uh, you guys hopefully um, remember this figure, but the first human genome produced by the Human Genome Project took um, about 13 years um, at $3 billion, and it used this um, Sanger sequencing method, uh, which is uh, the first method of, of DNA sequencing used, which is a pretty simple but um, fairly costly and slow. And the product of this was a composite draft of the haploid human genome. So what I mean by that is that it's a composite of the human genome. It's not the genome of a single individual. It's uh, actually um, any particular sequence can come from uh, 
several different people. Um, it's a draft. It's not e even now entirely complete. There are small regions of the genome that haven't been sequenced. Um, and it's haploid, right? So as you guys know, humans are diploids. We have two copies of individual genes. Um, and this is just uh, um, the the draft that we have from the Human Genome Project is just a single, surveying a single copy of each gene. And it was published in 2000. Um, and the first human diploid genome was published in 2007. And it's um, actually of this guy, Craig Venter, which you guys have, have heard about before. Um, and it, uh, this is an actual uh, diploid genome. So both alleles, um, both sets of genes uh, of this guy are, uh, have been entirely sequenced um, and are actually available online. And this was also done using the Sanger method. And so it's, it's still pretty costly, $77 million, but um, obviously much less than the uh, Human Genome Project. And um, it, what makes it easier, essentially, is it's a lot easier to put together when you already know roughly where the pieces should go, and you know that from the original genome sequence. Um, the second human diploid genome came from this guy, James Watson, um, uh, which you guys have obviously know about. And it was published in 2008 and only took four months and $1.5 million because they used the latest, um, this, the next gen sequencing technology, which lets you, uh, which is much cheaper than Sanger and is uh, um, also much faster. All right. So, what does this mean? Um, it, the price is actually continuing to fall. Right now, I think kind of the maximum that you'd expect to pay for a complete genome is about $100,000. Um, and it, it'll eventually uh, get even lower. Um, so what this means is that there's going to be a lot of data for research, researchers who are studying genetic variation. Um, you know, in the past, it's always been kind of a trade-off. You can get a lot of sequence um, of a few individuals, or you can get um, uh, a, a small amount of sequence data over a lot of individuals. But now, um, as these costs are going down, you're going to be able to study a lot of genetic information of a lot of uh, different people. So you can ask kind of questions that um, previously would not have been feasible. And so I'm going to talk about um, two of these projects um, that are incorporating large scale genomic studies of humans. One is the International HapMap Project. Um, some of you might have heard of this already. And also this Personal Genome Project. So uh, the International HapMap Project is hoping to study genetic variation that's present in four human populations. So um, they took blood samples from uh, a group of Americans with European ancestry, um, a group of Nigerians, and then groups of um, Japanese from Tokyo and Chinese from Beijing. And what they're doing is um, essentially building this haplotype map. And I'm going to explain what that is. The first, the first thing they did is they identified single nucleotide polymorphisms in the human genome. And I think you guys have come across this word before, right? Um, but I'll remind you what it is. Uh, when you look across the sequence, the DNA sequence of any uh, group of individuals, it, it's going to look mostly the same, right? That's what uh, Dan was talking about earlier, where like 99.5% uh, identical at the sequence level. Um, but every 2,000 base pairs or so, there will be a particular site in the genome where you could have, uh, where you see variation. One person um, here might have a G, and another person might have an A. All right? So you can um, scan along and find these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs in the genome. And 
it turns out that if you look across like a large range of the chromosome, like um, you know, this will be like tens of thousands of base pairs, you'll notice patterns of genotypes, right? So an individual who has at this position A, C, G, G, A, um, et cetera, uh, essentially um, these allele, these this genotype, um, the particular sequence they have at these alleles. Uh, are, are linked, okay? So, um, so what this means is that if a person has, say, ACG at these um, at these alleles, they'll likely have the rest of the pattern that's identical to that, okay? So they are linked. These um, the SNPs, uh, the particular genotype that the SNPs are linked, okay? And a region that's linked um, is called, a region of linked alleles is called a haplotype. So is everybody clear about what a haplotype is? Okay. Um, so this HapMap project is basically identifying all the haplotypes that are present in those four populations. Um, and um, another step is that if you look at Okay, across these four haplotypes, what's the least amount of information you need to get from any individual to figure out which haplotype they belong to? And it turns out that if you know the sequence for three of these SNPs, then you can um, reliably predict the entire rest of the, um, the sequence. You can reliably predict the haplotype that they have. So does that make sense? So remember, so this, um, this set of linked alleles could span like 50,000 base pairs, all right? Um, and one inference you can make is that, well, the genotype at these particular alleles, these SNPs, are the same throughout that haplotype. So the genes that are also um, in these sequences are probably also the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, the, you know, different haplotypes could occur in, in multiple populations. Oh, okay. um, that's one of the things that they're investigating. Um, but um, yeah, in general, it could be like one population tends to have this haplotype, another population tends to have this haplotype, and, and so on. OK? So the really good thing about this project, then, is that um, all you need to do is genotype a person for three uh, for their genotype at three base pairs, and then you can figure out, um, uh, you know, that gives you information spanning possibly, you know, tens of thousands of base pairs, okay? So um, once you've identified these haplotypes, what researchers can do is you can go out and genotype individuals with, say, a particular uh, disease or some other interesting trait and figure out which haplotype they belong to um, or which, you know, which haplotypes they have. And then if you can associate, say, like all of, uh, you know, all individuals with this disease um, also have this haplotype, then what you can do is you can go back and search that haplotype for the gene that's responsible. Does that make sense? OK, and so this is actually, there's been a couple drafts of this completed, um, and they're still uh, working on um, extending it and, and publishing more complete data. So another uh, even more ambitious project is this personal genome project. So um, here, what they're trying to do is, is essentially a, a similar experiment, um, do a massive, uh, do a large-scale study of human genetic variation, 
Um, and they're doing it by sequencing the entire genome of many individuals. Um, and so what they're doing basically is participants are donating tissue samples and then the entire DNA sequence is uh, sequenced using these next gen technologies. Um, and so what you get, so for each participant then you have this, um, their genome plus you have phenotype data. And so this is actually the, the principal investigator of the project, um, George Church from Harvard. And basically they take um, you know, the kind of phenotype data that uh, they have with each genome is uh, pictures, um, kind of like mug shots. But they also post medical history, race, ethnicity, uh, things like blood pressure, um, height, eye color. Um, and so, um, so basically, uh, you know, what's different about, say, this project than like the Human Genome Project is you're having a lot of genomes, but you're also having a lot of uh, phenotypes. So you're able to associate the two, figure out which genes correspond to things like eye color or blood pressure or, you know, curly hair, or things like that. And also with the medical history, um, uh, traits uh, like diseases. So, so far there's only um, 10 participants, including um, the principal investigator, George Church, and the Harvard psychologist, Steven Pinker. You guys might have heard of him. But um, their ultimate goal is to get 100,000 participants. And, um, but 10 so far have their uh, genomes and phenotype data posted. Um, and there is one uh, kind of drawback is uh, it currently only the participants' coding sequences have been published. So what that means is, right, you have the raw data, the raw DNA sequence, and then um, uh, the part that codes for the gene is transcribed into mRNA. You get this RNA transcript, and it gets cut together so that the exons are forming a continuous strand, and then that gets translated into a protein, right? Everybody remembers that central dogma stuff, right? So only the DNA that corresponds to the exons uh, are sequenced, okay? So, and this, it turns out, is only like 1.5% of the total genome. So um, it's still a lot of sequence, it's a lot of information, uh, but it's still, you know, somewhat limited. Um, so this project is gonna generate um, an enormous amount of data um, related to genetic variation. So you're gonna have a lot of power once this database grows to associate genes with diseases or other phenotypes. Um, but there can also be um, you know, other issues that arise uh, that are gonna have to be dealt with. Um, and one of these is privacy. So you can actually volunteer for this. You can go to their website and um, apply, but uh, they do uh, offer some pretty strong warnings. Um, and they published a list of like worst case scenarios that uh, could, um, you know, could affect you if you do volunteer. Because uh, the data is, um, you know, technically anonymous, but again, if you have, um, if you're publishing the medical history, the vital information, and uh, facial photographs, it's gonna be pretty easy to, to figure out which um, set of data is yours. And so some of the things that could happen to participants um, are basically the same sorts of things that could happen with, um, you know, if your DNA is in a database like CODIS or, um, you know, if somebody has a DNA sample on you, you could use that information to infer paternity. Um, there could be issues with uh, um, uh, affecting employment or insurance. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and you could be, find out you're related to uh, a criminal or your DNA could be used to incriminate relatives. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, no, it, it's funded um, through government agencies. Volunteers, I, I, I'm not sure if they're compensated or not. Uh, but it's not the case where the volunteers would pay. Although, if you did want your um, DNA sequenced like, and not posted, uh, there are companies that can do that. And it's like $100,000. Um, I, I'm sure it's just uh, like technical. Like there's only, you know, like, I don't know how many, like 10, 20 people in the lab and it, it, it's going to take time. But the data that they do have that, they're, that they've generated and can publish, um, just go, they just have 10 available now. But I'm sure, you know, it'll, it'll pick up soon. Um, so again, so like uh, you could use DNA, so basically um, this makes sense, like a DNA from yourself could be used to, um, to incriminate relatives. And uh, this is kind of a far-fetched one at this point, but somebody could, in theory, make DNA that was identical to yours and then say plant it at a crime scene or something, but that's, um, I, think, I think that would actually be extremely costly. Uh, and, and one of the, like, kind of the real, uh, kind of one of the drawbacks and, um, you know, might turn people away is that you might find that you have a, a high likelihood of contracting a disease or developing a disease that, where there is no effective treatment options. So some people might not be comfortable with that. Yeah. Well, um, so basically, like, my sister and I, we share half our genes. Um, if you wanted to, like, uh, show that she was innocent, but she's not in, you can't get a DNA sample from her, but you know my DNA, um, you know that my DNA is going to be similar to hers, so that if you can show that, you know, uh, like, basically do the DNA test on me, like, as if I was a suspect, um, then you could infer that it would also apply to her. Exactly. Right. I, I believe so. Like if you can prove a relative um, or like, you know, a relative has a high chance. If, if you can show that a relative would be a possible suspect, then um, it would apply to that person. All right, so another issue is this, this idea of um, um, you're increasing the potential, that basically the amount of information that could be used to discriminate against you. Um, so uh, a person's genotype could make them more likely to develop a disease, uh, make them riskier to employ or insure. Um, and so I think Dan mentioned this, but um, there's actually been a law enacted uh, in 2008, this Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and it's basically saying that uh, employers cannot um, factor in your genotype or the results of some genetic test um, to deny you employment or, or uh, coverage in the case of insurance companies. Um, so this does offer some protections, and I think some states actually have, uh, like, even stronger, um, like, you can't discriminate in any situation based on genetic information. Um, so another question is, uh, with these projects generating a lot of, of data, a lot of it can be useful in, in medical purposes, right? So what's going to be a fair way uh, of using this data? Um, so the two projects that I talked about, the HapMap and the Personal Genomes Project, are um, you know, waiving any copyrights, and they're making, it, uh, making all their data available as soon as it comes out. Uh, but you know, there are private researchers, and they might not be so, 
was so willing to share. Um, so there needs to be a kind of a discussion on what, what limits can be put um, or should be put uh, on genomic information. Um, and so this is actually um, a case uh, came up uh, just a week ago involving this company called Myriad Genetics. So one of the, um, I, I think you guys have probably talked about this or will talk about this, but one of the first genetic tests that could show you your um, potential to develop a disease were these um, BRCA1 genes. Uh, if you had a particular genotype at them, you were increased, you had an increased susceptibility to breast cancer. Um, and as it stands, uh, or as it stood, Marriott holds exclusive rights to test for mutations that increase susceptibility to breast cancer, even though, you know, the, the sequence of these genes is common knowledge, right? That comes from the Human Genome Project. Um, and also from, uh, we know what alleles uh, of BRCA1 and 2 will increase your susceptibility to cancer, right? That's just a, a, a sequence. Um, so, in potential, so potentially anybody could, could design a test for these alleles, right? Um, but as it stands, um, Myriad holds the exclusive rights um, and it costs about three thousand dollars, which um, is definitely you know much, uh, much more than the actual cost of, of doing a, um, what is essentially a PCR reaction, right? Um, which is actually you know not costly at all. So the question then is: Is that fair? And is it legal? Can you really, um, you know, claim exclusive rights to essentially do a PCR reaction? Um, on a, a, a naturally occurring sequence. And recently, so this is actually last week, a judge ruled that no, you can't. That, so the patents on the BRCA genes are, are not valid. Um, and Myriad tried to argue that, well, the isolated sequence is novel, so therefore they can patent it. But um, uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, the, it, the judge basically didn't buy that, right? He said that it was a product of nature and therefore not patentable, okay? Um, so does everybody kind of understand, like, the, re the rationale for, uh, for the judge dismissing that? Because in general, like when you make some kind of discovery, like you discover uh, a new kind of fish species uh, or something, uh, you can't, you don't claim ownership of that. You can't like say, okay, this is my fish species and nobody else can use it or look at it or whatever. Um, it's a product of nature. You just happen to discover it. Um, and it's the same basic thing with a, a gene sequence, right? You didn't really make it. Uh, all you did was essentially discover it. Um, so, but the problem is, is that this is extremely common what Myriad did. So there's actually um, uh, many, many genes, many coding genes are actually patented. Uh, so, uh, so now, how is this going to affect the genetic testing industry? Um, and just really, I mean, I, I have no idea. Um, it will likely be a good thing for researchers because now uh, they can feel more free to study BRCA genes, for example. Um, OK. So just to sum up, um, Low-cost sequencing is going to enable uh, large-scale studies of human genetic variation, so much larger than has been possible in the past. <clears throat> and so these studies are going to let, uh, going to help researchers um, find genes that are responsible for diseases and other traits, probably even more rapidly than than um, we discover them now. 
Um, and so there's huge scientific promise in these projects, uh, like the HapMap and the Personal Genome Project. Um, but there's going to be more and more of these issues, like the case with Myriad, where um, you know there's not necessarily a clear-cut uh, um, choice of how to deal with this data. Okay. Um, are there questions? Okay. Uh, I have a study question. Um, the Personal Genome Project is uh, currently only sequencing the coding sequences of participants. So um, what are some drawbacks to this approach? And you guys can think about that. All right, so if there's no questions, then you guys can go.